Nathan again. Uh, we will continue today in our series on uh, work. We started talking about the four purposes of the church and we um, talked about the acronym that we use for, as a name for our church. We are Word International and uh, Word, W-O-R-D is an acronym for Worship, Outreach, Relationship and Discipleship. Um, this is to remind us of the purpose of the church. We looked last week at Acts chapter 2 and how the early church was not only worshipping God, but they were always involved in outreach, reaching out uh, to other people. Um, they were involved in uh, relationship, they, um, they had a community together, so they uh, gave emphasis to relationships and to building up strong relationships among themselves. And of course there was an emphasis on discipleship. We read how they continued to go back to the apostles' teachings and how they continued to study the word of God. Um, and they continued to grow in their faith and in spirit before us. Um, and uh, we, I remember during our workers' meeting, we used the example of a chair. A chair has four legs. If three legs are okay but one is missing, the chair isn't very useful, isn't it? Um, and as a church, we need to have all uh, four areas developed really for us to be all that God wants us to be. Um, we don't have to be the best church in London, but we have to be the best church that we can be. Amen. We are not called to be a different type of church or better than other churches, but we are called to be the best church we can be with the talents and the gifts and the time and the resources and the people that God has given us. And for that to happen, you need to give attention um, to all four areas and not just one. And by the way, that's true for us as um, individual Christians as well. For us to grow in a uh, balanced and uh, uh, mature way, we need to, to grow and develop in, in all areas. Um, we need to grow in our faith, but we need to also grow in our relationships with one another. We have to be integrated in, in the church, in the community, be part of church life. Um, we need to grow, of course, in worship and also grow in outreach, our desire to reach out to the Lord. So next week we will start then talking about the second topic, which is reaching out. Um, but for today, so we spend two Sundays per uh, topic. Today we have our second Sunday on worship. And the topic for today is how to walk in the church. So we talked last week about worship in general. Um, and today I would like to talk about the worship service. We call the time here on Sundays um, our worship service. Uh, we um, use that, um, that term or we use that name because what we do here is worship. But I want us to look in more detail at what do we do actually when we come here. And why do you come to church and how do you walk into church? How do we walk into church? How did you walk into church today? Um, so we will talk a bit about it by looking at Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 to 25. Uh, for those who haven't been here uh, with us last week, uh, we talked about worship and we said that to worship God is to seek God's words and to give Him His word. To seek God's words and to give Him His word. You cannot worship God, you cannot love God, you cannot praise God, you cannot thank God if you don't see God in your life. It's impossible, isn't it? And this is why oftentimes when we sing, we would say things like, God, open the eyes of my heart. Today we sang about the light of the world that has come down and he has enabled us to see God. If your eyes are closed, you cannot praise God. And um, if we think back, I'm sure that we have times maybe in our experience as Christians when we came to church and we were singing songs, we were uh, praying, and you felt quite cold and you didn't feel like the songs are moving you, you didn't feel like you are really communicating with God, you, you didn't feel anything really. And the reason why that was the case, most probably, was not because of the songs or the worship leader. It's just that we came to church unprepared. We did not really take time to, to see God, to remember the goodness, the faithfulness, the provisions um, of God in our lives. And then we come to church and we don't feel like singing because we haven't seen God. But when you have seen God, your natural response is praise. We said in all areas of life, when you see excellence in any area, if you go to a restaurant and you eat a very good meal, what do you do? You tell others about it. You give praise. You, 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 want, to, you want to articulate praise, isn't it? You want to tell the, um, the cook that, you know, that has been the best meal that I've eaten, isn't it? Um, praise is a natural response to excellence. And when we see God, who is of greater value and greater worth and better than anything else and anyone else, our natural response is that we want to praise God. We want to thank God. We want to honor God, right? So we see God, and then we give God, or we ascribe to God, the worth and value that is due to Him. 
And we use that um, uh, illustration and example of if you were to have a, a very valuable piece of furniture or a vase that is lying around in the attic and you never realize the, the great worth and value of that um, uh, vase. If somebody comes to your house and tells you, you know what, that vase is worth 10 million pounds. You won't just leave it in the attic anymore, isn't it? You will take it out of the living room, you will clean it, and you will put it in a place where everyone can see it. It will become the center of your living room, right? Because it is so precious, so valuable. It's the best thing that you have, and you want everyone to see it. Unless you live in an unsafe area, and you're afraid that you will get robbed. <laughs> but in a, in a safe place, in a safe world, you would want everyone to know what great gift you have, isn't it? So, it is not enough that we see the word of God. We need to give God the worth and value due to his name. We need to ascribe, we need to come to church and express our gratitude to him. It's not enough that we've seen him being faithful in our week. We have to come and talk about it. We have to praise God. We have to honor God. Um, and we say that, we said, we talked about responding to God in a way that engages all of our being. Everything is transformed. And we looked at the commandment of Jesus to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, all of our being. We respond with all of our being. Worship is not just about having an emotional experience. We come to church and we are all emotional and then we go out and nothing changed. Our mind has not changed. We still have the same opinions about people in the world. Our plans for our life have not changed. That is not worship. Worship transforms everything in us. It transforms everything in us. It transforms our relationships, the way we see ourselves and other people around us. So this is what worship is. It changes us and we are changed to become more and more like Jesus Christ. And the reason why that is, we said, we looked at a spiritual law or a spiritual principle from Psalms 115 verse 8, where the psalmist says that we become what we worship. We become what we worship. If you worship money, you become more greedy. Right? That is a, a law of, uh, of the way God has made us to be. This is how we are. When you worship God, you become more like God. You, you worship, or you become what you worship because you love what you worship, isn't it? And we become like what we love. If I, if I love someone so much and if I say, oh, you know, uh, the way my wife is, you know, in terms of you know, her, her character, I really want to become like her because I really love the way she is. I will try to become more like her. Isn't it? Because you, you want to become like what you love. We become what we worship because we worship what we love. And it's true when we talk about worshiping God more than um, in, in any other place. So what we worship is important. And we also said that everyone worships. Whether you are a Christian or not, everyone worships something. This is how God made us. We are made to worship. And if we don't worship God, we worship something or someone else. And if what we worship is not God, it will lead to our destruction. It will lead to misery. It will destroy relationships. It will destroy the way we see ourselves, the way we see our possessions. Uh, it leads to misery in life. And when we worship God, we experience healing and restoration. Amen. Because we are transformed. Our relationships are transformed to become more and more like Jesus and the way he relates to his people. So that is what we discussed yesterday. Now I want us to keep that in mind as we talk about our worship service um, here today and whenever we meet uh, together. Hebrews chapter 10, 19 to 25. We have then, my friends, complete freedom to go into the most holy place by means of the death of Jesus. He opened for us a new way, a living way through the curtain that is through his own body. We have a great priest in charge of the house of God. So let us come near to God with a sincere heart and a sure faith, with hearts that have been purified from a guilty conscience and with bodies washed with clean water. Let us hold on firmly to the hope we profess, because we can trust God to keep his promise. Let us be concerned for one another, to help one another to show love and to do good. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together, as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more, since you see that the day of the Lord is coming nearer. Our Father in heaven, we, we pray that as we study your word today, Lord, you may enlighten our minds, Lord, and you may help us see you more clearly and help us see your will for our lives more clearly. Help us to understand what worship you require of us. Father, you say in your word that it is you who seeks to worship, Lord, who seeks people who are willing to worship you, Father. And we 
Thank you, Lord, that us coming here today, Lord, it was not because of our initiative, but it is because you, Lord, have sought us out, Lord, and because you have chosen us and you have forgiven us and called us. Help us understand, Lord, the reason why you have called us to worship you, Father. Be with us today, Lord, and speak to us. In your good name we pray. Amen. The book um, to the Hebrews was written to a group of people, as the name says it. Um, it was a group of people who were, were the Jewish background. Um, so they were originally Jews and they became Christian. And uh, being Christian in the Roman Empire wasn't always easy. And we talked, when we discussed Revelation, we talked about the persecutions that Christians had to endure. And this group of people in particular uh, came to a point where it seems that many, many people in, in that church um, uh, came to a point where they said, you know what, it seems not worth anymore the sacrifice and the danger and the hardship and persecution for us to continue in our faith. It would be easier for us to return to Judaism, for us to become Jews again, and to continue living our life in peace. And this letter was written, and we don't really know who wrote it because there's no, in the introduction, the author isn't mentioned, so we don't really know who wrote it. Some say it was Paul, but we don't really know. But whoever wrote it, wrote this letter to encourage this community and tell them, continue meeting together. Don't give up meeting together. Yes, it's dangerous. And, uh, in other chapters, they talk, he talks about some of the sacrifices they have made and persecution they have endured. And he says, yes, it's difficult. I know. I'm aware of it. It's difficult for you. It's difficult for all of us. But continue to meet together. And by no means think of going back to Judaism. That has become, that system has become obsolete, Hebrew says, because Jesus Christ has come. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than the law. He's greater than the high priest who in the past tried to usher you into the presence of God. Jesus is greater than everything that we had in Judaism. And that is quite important on a side note. Um, I, I know that uh, and when I was at Bible school, we talked and we had people up amongst us who and we discussed our view as Christians towards uh, Judaism and how do we relate with, uh, with Jews. And of course, we recognize that the Jewish people are uh, special in God's plan of salvation. But it is quite, quite telling. If you read the New Testament, if you read the book of Acts, the disciples were in prison. Peter and John were in prison because they evangelized not pagans, but Jews. And the religious leader said, stop doing that. Just let them be Jews and you continue and do whatever you want, but stop proselyting. And they said, no, we can't. Because salvation is only in the name of Jesus. So whatever our views are about Judaism and the Jewish people today, let us be sure that there is one way of salvation. There is one plan that God has and uh, there is one purpose that God has for all of us, Jew and Gentile alike. God wants us to recognize Jesus as the Son of God, as the Messiah. Amen. Now that's just a, a side point here. Now, the letter was written to encourage this group to continue in their faith, to continue attending um, uh, worship services, but also to continue in their faith as Christians. And there are two points I want to make and two questions I want to raise. And it's a very simple message, and we talked about worship already the last time. So I'll be referring to some of the things we said last Sunday as well. The first point is this. Remember, worship is for God. How do you walk into church? Well, the first thing that we should remember is that worship is for God. We come to church to draw near to God. We don't come to draw near to one another in the first place. We come to church to draw near to God. Um, as simple as that. So worship is for God. What we do here is for, for, for God. The worship service focuses on what God has done for us, His intervention in human history and in our lives. That is what the worship service and our worship services are about. You know, I, I'm in the process of uh, finalizing the calendar for this year together with the pastors, and I looked at the dates that we have and events and activities that we have planned, and I, 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 be, I became a bit worried when I looked at the calendar and I, somehow the impression that you get if somebody outside the church could see the calendar is that we have a lot of activities, and some of the activities we have is Easter, Christmas, um, Pentecost, and it seems that this is just you know, one of the activities that we have. We have a men's convergence and we have Easter. We have a ladies' convergence and Christmas. But it would be a mistake to, to look at our calendar and to interpret it in such a way. Because what we do as a church, our calendar, our church calendar, should reflect what God has done in our life. 
In the Old Testament, the calendar of the Jewish people reflected the salvation history of Israel. They reflected on how God brought them out of Egypt, how God has been with them in the wilderness, how God was guiding them. Um, through the feasts that they celebrated, through Passover, the Day of Atonement, and other feasts that they had, the Feast of Tabernacle, reminding them of the 40 years in the wilderness, everything was geared uh, towards reminding Israel of their salvation history, how God has been with them throughout the history. And what we do as a church, our services and our calendar should do the same thing. We should be reminded of God's intervention in our lives and in our history. Amen. So this is why we celebrate Advent. It's a time of preparation, waiting for Jesus coming. We celebrate Christmas because this is when Jesus Christ came. The Son of God came into this world. Uh, we celebrate um, Easter right? because this is when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And these are important days in our calendar. We celebrate Pentecost because that is the day when the Holy Spirit was poured out. These are important days in our church calendar. This is what we focus on. And then we have other activities that help us as a church. We have convergences and dance and fellowships and so on. But this is a different set, a different category of events that we have. Does that make sense? Right? So our church calendar and our time together here on Sundays reminds us um, of what God has done and who God is in our lives. The worship service is for God. He deserves all glory honor, praise that we ascribe to Him. We come here and we don't talk about ourselves. And it would be uh, strange, but maybe for somebody who has never been to church and who starts coming, he might be asking, how come that you always talk about God? Why don't you talk about how to have a better career? Why don't you talk about uh, marriage and other important topics and we want to hear about this and that? Uh, but this is not what we are called to do. We are called to speak about what God has done. So we, we come here to church in first place because of God, and that is important. Now, you might say, well, I want to come to church because I believe if my children grow up in church, um, they will grow up with Christian values and that will be important for them later on in life. And I've heard that people say. Um, somebody came and said, you know, I've not been to church in a long time, but I have a daughter now, and I grew up as a Christian. I, I appreciate the values that I somehow carry with me now, and I, I want my daughter to have the same values. So I want to come to church. Now, you might say it's a very a noble thought and decision to come to church, but it won't work that way. You have to come to church because of Jesus and because of God. We come to church because of God. Everything else is an added benefit that we have. You don't come to church because you want a stronger marriage, but you don't care about God. I want a stronger family, but I don't care about God. I want a better career, but I don't care actually about God. That's not how it works. The Bible says, seek God, seek the righteousness of God, seek the kingdom of God first, and everything else will be added unto you. Yes, there is benefit, in a way, that we receive from coming to church. I do believe that families become stronger, and marriages become stronger, and I do believe that we can learn a lot of things about how to behave at work. But it won't happen if we come here, not because we want to worship God, but because we want to benefit from being part of this community. Our focus is on God. We draw near to God. That is what the worship service is all about. We come here together to draw near to God. And when we draw near to God, there are blessings that will follow from the experience of worshiping God. Amen? Question, how can we draw near to God? So we come to church to draw near to God, but one of the <coughs> questions that these people must have had is how, how can we draw near to God? And the reason why that is an important question is because these were Jews, they had a Jewish background, and we read in our passage today about the fact that God is a holy God, and He lives in the Holy of Holies, so in the Old Testament, people knew that He's in the Holy of Holies. Um, we, we read in verse 22, so let us come near to God, with a sincere heart and a sure faith, with hearts that have been purified from a guilty conscience and with bodies washed with clean water. God is a holy God. Later on in chapter 12, we, we read, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be faithful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So these people were aware that God is holy. God is holy. How can you approach a holy God? Because I am not holy. I am not holy. I am not perfect. So how can I come near God? 
when he is holy. And they knew how in the Old Testament, when the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies, the place where the glory of God would descend on the Day of Atonement to rest upon the Ark of the Covenant, they knew how if the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, and if he wasn't ready, he would be struck dead. And this is why they would, they would attach a string to his leg, and if there was no movement anymore, if, they, if it didn't come out anymore, they would pull him out, because no one would dare to go into the Holy of Holies. So how do you come into the presence of God if God is holy? Well, um, a good place to begin with is to examine our hearts. It says we have to come with sincere hearts, with honesty, without duplicity, without hypocrisy. We have to come before God sincerely, as we are. If you read the Psalms, one, one of the main points uh, that we learn from the Psalms is that when we come reverent, but with confidence, sometimes the reason why we don't experience God is because we have too much confidence, but too little reverence. And so we come into church and everything is very casual and it's nothing special and God is my good buddy and I can come in whatever way I want and it is fine anyway, he knows me. And we don't experience God and we develop maybe an external form of spirituality, but there's no real life, there's no real spiritual life, there's no real spiritual experience. And sometimes we don't experience God because we don't have enough confidence. Our sin keeps us away from God. Reminded of the mistakes we've done in the past and we say, I'm not good enough to come to church today. Well, Hebrew says, whatever you have done, maybe some of you have even gone back to Judaism already, maybe you've given up your faith already, but Hebrew says, continue coming. Continue coming, but remember these two things. Remember God is holy, but remember also Jesus has made a way for us to come into the presence of this holy God. Amen? So we keep these two attitudes in balance. We keep both um, truths before our eyes. God is holy, yet God is also willing to welcome us because the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for our sins. He has covered our iniquities. He has been forgiven because of Jesus Christ. Amen? The second point I want to make is this. Remember, worship is for our formation. Remember, worship is for our formation. Yes, we come here to worship God, but if we really come to worship God, we will also be changed in the process. We have then, my friends, complete freedom to go into the most holy place by means of the death of Jesus. Let us be concerned for one another, to help one another, to show love and to do good. Remember when Moses had the experience of meeting with God, and he just had a glimpse of the back of God, it seems, on top of Mount Sinai. He came back down into the camp. What happened to, to Moses? What did people say when they saw Moses' back? He said, Moses, you have to cover your face, because the radiance is just too much, isn't it? That encounter with God really changed Moses, and it was almost too much for people to take. Encountering God will change us as well. I believe that it will change our relationship, it will change our attitudes, it will change our marriages, our families. It can change us if our focus is God. I'm sure when Moses went up the mountain, he didn't say, oh, I want to meet with God, so when I come down, my radiance will be amazing. No, he went up the mountain because he said, I want to meet with God. He was desperate to meet with God. And that was a byproduct of his desire and his experience with God. What does it mean when we say that worship is for our formation? Well, first of all, in worship, we proclaim the gospel, and we've seen that so, so well today in our song. We, we sung so much about grace. We sung so much about grace today. In worship, we proclaim, we preach, we sing, we pray, and we thank God. We respond to the salvation that he has given us. We respond to the gospel. Gospel is that term that we use to summarize the way God has saved us. And it's an important, uh, an important concept for us to understand. What is the gospel? We'll talk more about it over the next two Sundays when we talk about sharing the gospel. But just to give you a glimpse or to illustrate what the gospel is. Imagine you live in an ancient town, and the town is besieged, and there's a powerful army that is about to take over that town. Now, what do you need in that situation? You need military advisors who are able to tell you where to, where to duck, where to dig the trenches, where to position the soldiers, where to have the uh, archers uh, so that you can defend you can defend the town, isn't it? What you need is advice. There's an enemy attacking, and you need advice to know how to defend yourself. Now, what would happen if while you are in the city, besieged by that powerful army, you hear news that a great king has arrived and has defeated that army? 
What you need now is not advice, you need messengers to go to every part of that town and to proclaim the good news that the enemy has been defeated. You don't have to defend, you don't have to run away anymore because the enemy has been defeated. And that is what the gospel is. It is the good news that the enemy has been defeated. We don't have to run away anymore. We don't have to try and struggle through life on our own. We don't have to struggle with our own temptations on our own anymore. The enemy has been defeated. That is what the gospel is. It is the good news of salvation. We have been saved by a great king. Amen. And that is what makes Christianity different to all other religions. And some might say, oh, that's very arrogant to say. But I'm sorry because I don't see that in any other religion. In all other religions, it's about defending the town, right? Ways of defending the town, of pushing back evil, pushing back the enemy, trying to live a good life on your own. Christianity says, no, you can't. The enemy is too strong. The enemy is too strong. What you need is a savior. And that is what the gospel is. So when we come to church, we don't just give good advice. Preaching is not just about giving good advice on how to live or uh, how to relate to your spouse. Preaching and our song should be about the gospel. Yeah. And the message of the gospel is that we have been saved without firing an arrow. We have been saved by grace, as we have sung and heard all throughout our worship today. We have been, we have been saved by the grace of God. That is what the focus of our service is on Sunday. So we don't come here to to sing or to preach ourselves. The Apostle Paul says, I do not, we do not preach ourselves. Paul says, we preach the crucified Christ. Yeah. We preach the gospel. He says, yes, yeah, foolishness to the Greeks. They don't understand it. But I'm telling you, that is the wisdom of God. That is how true victory is experienced in life, by putting your trust in God, by putting your trust in Jesus. Amen? We preach the gospel. We don't sing and preach to entertain people. We don't sing and preach to make me, people feel better about themselves. We preach the gospel. We sing the gospel. Now, when we do that, as we give thanks to God, as we praise God, as we bring our offering in response to the great salvation God has accomplished for us, when we do that, we are being transformed. And we talked about it last Sunday. It is impossible for us to experience the forgiveness of God and to still remain unforgiving ourselves. Because experiencing forgiveness will make us become more forgiving ourselves. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. In fact, the, the way to understand whether we have, been, we have understood that God has forgiven us and we have accepted the forgiveness of God is to check how forgiving am I? How forgiving am I? Mm -hmm. And if you examine your life and if your conclusion is, actually I'm not very forgiving at all. I can't even forgive my wife. I already become very upset that she leaves the toothpaste open. Now, then there's a problem. You have to ask yourself, have I, really, have I really, really experienced the forgiveness of God? Because if we have experienced that forgiveness of God, we will become more forgiving ourselves. If we experience and understand the grace of God, we will not only praise God for the grace He's given us, but we become more gracious also with one another. Isn't it? But when we don't experience that grace, we are full of self-righteousness. We are always right, the others are always wrong, and we never see our mistakes. Worship transforms us. If we come to worship God, if we come to draw near to God, because God is holy, He is most loving, most gracious, most merciful, as we love Him and worship Him, we become more like Him. In terms of formation, worship is also important, because in a way, this, what we do here is a rehearsal, it is a practice for living out in the world. If uh, Max decides to swim the Atlantic, but he realizes he can't swim, it wouldn't be very wise for him to go straight to swimming the Atlantic. What I would advise him is to go first to a swimming pool and to learn how to swim. It makes sense, right? And this is our swimming pool here. This is our swimming pool. This is a, a safe place for us to learn to be patient, forgiving, loving, gracious, and so on. If you can't be forgiving with your brothers who love you, how can you forgive in an unforgiving world? If you can't be patient with people who are kind to you, how can you be patient with people who don't like you? It's impossible, isn't it? If you want to live a successful life out in the world, this is our swimming pool. This is where we learn how to live as Christians. Amen? So this is why it's important. And when we skip coming to church, and this is why the writer says, don't stop going to church because you need that practice. It is impossible for you to live a life as a Christian in the world if you 
don't experience that nourishment and that encouragement and the strength and uh, the, the being built up on Sundays, it is impossible. You won't be able to live a victorious life. So worship is also for our formation. We don't come here for any selfish benefits, not even for the sake of growing in whatever character we want to grow. We come here because of God. We come here because we acknowledge that He deserves all glory, honor, and praise. But when we come here to worship God, there is a byproduct that is very important for us nevertheless. We are transformed to become more and more like Jesus Christ. Amen? And this is why we come to worship. And that is the true measure of worship. It is not your emotional experience on a Sunday. That is not what the true measure of genuine worship is. It is your transformation. Have you been transformed? Is God changing your mind? Is God transforming your mind? Is God transforming your relationships? Has your relationship with your manager improved? That is a true measure of worship. Have you become more patient with your colleagues? If that is the case, praise God. Because you have learned to worship God. You are worshiping God with all of your heart. And because you do that, God is changing you. By His grace, God is changing us to become more and more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now finally, what do we do when we don't feel like going to church? I hope that this doesn't happen very often, that we don't feel like going to church. But what do we do when we don't feel like going to church? Well, remind yourself of what we have just discussed. And this is the verse that I've referred to before. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together, as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more, since you see that the day of the Lord is coming nearer. Mm -hmm. But if you don't feel like going to church, if you feel that uh, the laundry that you have to wash is more important than worshiping God, or you feel that uh, the bills that you have to go through and pay are more important than acknowledging that it is God who gives you the money to pay those bills, well, remember this, first of all, Remember and tell yourself, Jesus made such a sacrifice for me. Today, as I don't feel like going, I have an opportunity to, to sacrifice what I feel like doing so that I can still go to church and please God. Jesus made a huge sacrifice for us so that we can come into the presence of God. When you don't feel like going, tell yourself, today I'm going to sacrifice what I feel like doing. I feel like sleeping until 12 o'clock or until 3 o'clock, so I won't be able to go to church. But I'm going to sacrifice what I feel like doing so that I can please God by worshiping Him because He wants me to worship Him. He wants me to go. I have other plans. Friends are inviting me to go out today, but I will sacrifice what I feel right now because somebody made a far greater sacrifice for me so that I can even have that opportunity and privilege of praising and worshiping God. Amen. We remind ourselves of the great privilege that worship is. And we continue meeting together. We don't stop meeting together. I need encouragement and nourishment for today and for the rest of the week. Remind yourself of it. You are not Superman. You are not Superman. You need infield again and again. You need to be encouraged. You need to hear the word of God. You need to be encouraged by other people around you. We need one another. We need to be here on Sundays to be ready for the rest of the week. And lastly, I need to encourage others. I have to go because there might be someone who uh, is discouraged, who's got a problem, and God can use me to bless them, to pray for them, to encourage them. You know, I was very encouraged to see Matt here today. Let me say that. Because we were struggling with the sound. If you were here for our time of singing, it was quite difficult because Noel is still on holiday, and uh, the sound wasn't really prepared. And I am glad when I saw Matt fiddling around it because I knew everything will be fine by the, by the time I get to preach. At least the will be okay. Right? But this is how it is. All of us have a different gift. And when we come here to worship God, we use our gift. It's a bit like that. Imagine you've got five children, and the present you made them is a uh, PS4 station. But you didn't just give everything, the whole pack, to one child. What you did is, you gave one controller to a child, a cable to the other child, another controller to a child, you gave the games to your wife, and you gave the console to somebody else. Now, for the family to enjoy playing PS4, everyone has to use their gift, isn't it? If somebody says, no, 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 this is just my gift, you know, the games are mine, I'm not going to share. Well, okay, but you know, you don't have a controller to use your games, isn't it? So everyone needs to share, as, we, as everyone shares the gifts that we have, we are able to worship God together and to enjoy all the benefits that come from being a worshiping community. Amen? That is why everyone is important. Everyone is important. Everyone is a role to play. 
you being here, encouraging others, praying, and just coming in today, if you come on a Sunday, you see that there's so many things that are happening even before the service starts. And without those people doing the things they do, we wouldn't be able to enjoy our time together the way we do. There are people praying in the small chapel half an hour before the service starts. Without them praying, I don't think that we could experience the atmosphere and the presence of God the way we do, because prayers are important. God answers and God is moved by prayers, and they spend half an hour before the service starts praying for all of us so that we can experience God. There are people setting up the instruments. There are people that came at 12 practicing the songs. There are people that practice during the week already. Everyone has a part to play. We can pray, we can encourage, uh, we can help each other to make sure that we together as a community worship God because He deserves it. And we worship God because this is the way that we are changed and become the people God wants us to be. Amen? Worship is important. In closing, allow me to focus again on the gospel. And in the verses before our scripture, uh, the writer talks about that gospel message again. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but the body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, this is Jesus speaking, Here I am, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We worship God by grace. It is not because we deserve to be in this place. We deserve to know God. We deserve to be blessed by God. We worship God because Jesus Christ said, I want to do your will, Father. Even if that means that my body will be torn, but I will endure it so that there will be a way for Brother Noel, for Sister Marian, for Sister Melba, for Sister uh, Lillian, for all of us here today, to experience the presence of God. Amen. I will do that, my God, Jesus Christ said, so that they can worship you, they can know you, they can see you. Is that not wonderful? Yeah. We remember the gospel. We remember Jesus Christ when we come here. It's all about him. As we have sung in that song, it's all about Jesus. That is the heart of worship. It's Jesus. It is not the instruments. It is not the voices. It is all about Jesus.